So this is section 1.2, which is functions and their properties. This is going to cover function definition and notation, domain and range, continuity, increasing and decreasing, boundedness, local and absolute extrema, symmetry, asymptotes, and end behavior. This is a huge section. There's a lot of stuff in this section. So um, hopefully a lot of it is stuff you've seen before and remember, but there is a lot to this. Okay, so the first example is seeing a function graphically. Of the three graphs below, which is not a graph of a function? So if you remember, oops, I'm on a race. We use the vertical line test to determine if something is a function. So if we look, the first graph is yes, it's a function. Second graph is yes, it's a function. The third graph, if I were to pass a vertical line through it right there, it would cross in three spots, so therefore it is not a function. So remember, the vertical line test is passing a vertical line across a graph. It should only touch in one spot no matter where you put the vertical line. So if it does not pass, then it is not a function. Okay, so the next part is finding the domain. So you can always graph it so you have a visual. Um, but the way that, if just looking at the equation, the way that I always think of domain is that you've got two situations where it could be a problem. One is if you have a fraction, you can't divide by zero. And two is if you have an even root, like a square root, you can't have a negative under there and get a real answer out. So square roots and fractions are the two areas that you're looking for. If it's not one of those, chances are your domain is just all real numbers. So um, the other situation that could cause a problem is if it's in a context or real world situation. So um, if you're talking about like time where that can't be negative or items that can't be negative or something like that. So um, sometimes you might have all real numbers as your solution, but then you have to define the domain as a smaller window of that because of the real life context. Okay, so this example right here says we have f of x equals the square root of x plus 2. We know that this is a square root. This is one of our situations that cause a problem, and it can't be negative underneath the square root. So we want to say that x plus 2 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. It can be 0 because you can take the square root of 0. So then if I solve that, I get x is greater than or equal to negative 2. So that's the inequality answer of a domain of the domain, um, if we want to write it as a inset notation or interval notation, we would use square brackets around the negative two to infinity. Okay, that was example A in the notes. I also want to go through B. So B had g of x equals the square root of x over x minus five. So this one actually has both problem areas. It has a fraction and a square root, so we have to account for both when we're doing the domain. So if we look at the square root first, we know that x has to be greater than or equal to zero. And then the x minus five in the denominator, we know that x can't be five. Five is the only number that would cause a problem. So then when we're writing the domain of the whole function, we have to take both of those and combine them. So we know that x has to be greater than or equal to zero but it also can't be five. So as we're writing this in set notation, we would say, oops, nope. <laughs> we would use square brackets for zero up to five. Five's our first problem number. And I'm gonna use curve brackets there because it can't be five. And then we would say five to infinity. So that would be our domain for B. Um, C in the notes talked about the area of an equilateral triangle with side length S. If you just looked at the formula without any context to it, the domain would be all real numbers, but because we can't have a negative side length of a triangle, um, the domain became zero to infinity. So that's an example of a real life context changing the domain. Okay, the next example is to find the range of f of x equals two over x. So you, could, you can find the range a couple different ways. You can find the domain first and then think about what the y values would be. Or you could graph. So it's always good to look at a picture of a graph. So 2 over x is going to look, this is just a sketch, something like this. 
So it's a hyperbola. So this is actually decreasing, not constant. So draw a better job. Okay, so there's our function. Not a great picture, but it gives you the idea. So we want to know what are the y values. So if we're thinking of this, um, our graph's going to go to negative infinity and positive infinity in the y direction. But we know that it's going to get closer and closer and closer to zero, but it's never going to touch zero. So that means that it can't be zero, but it can be any other y value. So our range for this, this again is y values. And we're talking about range. So our range would be negative infinity to zero with a curved bracket and then zero to infinity, okay? So the next thing is continuity. So continuity means that you don't have any breaks or holes or jumps in your graph. So this example here, this graph right here is continuous, the rest are not. So there's a whole bunch of different types of discontinuities. There's what's called a removable discontinuity. Oops, have some. <laughs> There we go. So you can see there's a hole on these graphs right here. Um, on this one, there's a point up here that, so for every x value, there is a defined y value. There's not just a hole in the graph on that one, but because it jumps um, to a different value, that makes it still a discontinuity. You could have a jump, like on this one, and then you could have infinite discontinuity, which is like, um, our hyperbola that we were talking about. So you can see there's clearly a break in the graph there. Okay, so the next one is asking us, which of the following figures shows functions that are discontinuous at x equals two? Okay, having trouble talking. So um, if you see the graph on the left, we don't have an issue at x equals two. This is where our graph is at x equals two. There's no hole there. So this graph is continuous. Okay, but then we do have an issue at x equals two on our graph at the right. So you can see there's a hole in the graph right there. So this one would be discontinuous. Okay. Okay, the next thing is talking about increasing and decreasing. So um, you did this last year in Algebra 2 talking about intervals of increasing, decreasing, and constant. Um, these are some different examples. So you can see what graphs look like. We know that if it's the as x is increasing, y is increasing, that's um, an increasing function. As x gets bigger, y gets smaller, that's decreasing. Constant means it's staying the same. This last one shows an example of having all three. So this would be decreasing between negative infinity to negative two, constant between negative two and two, and then increasing from two to infinity. So um, the thing that you need to remember when you're writing intervals of increasing, decreasing, and constant is that you're just using the x values. So this is using the x values to describe where the graph is either increasing, decreasing, or constant. Okay. The next thing is checking functions for symmetry. So this is one that I did not put an example in the notes, the written notes, but I am going through it on here just in case to refresh your memory from last year. So we can use symmetry to determine whether a function is even, odd, or neither. So if you have, like this example right here, is x squared plus three. So that's going to be a parabola that's shifted up three. So this would be even, because it has symmetry about, so I'm gonna write symmetry about the y-axis. So if you ever have something that is symmetrical over the y-axis, so like if I had a point here that was xy, I'd have a point over here that was negative xy. So if you have symmetry over the y-axis, then it is an even function, so this one is even. Just to go over the other possibilities, um, in order to be odd, you have to have symmetry about the origin. So what that means is that you can rotate the image, the um, function 180 degrees, and it will look the same. 
So if you can rotate, so that would mean like you have a point x, y, you also have the point on the function negative x, negative y. Okay, so if you have symmetry about the origin, then it is odd. And if you have neither, so let's say I have a parabola, but it's shifted to the right. That is not symmetrical about the y-axis, and it is not symmetrical about the origin, so therefore this would be neither. So remember that symmetry can tell you if it's even odd or neither. Okay, the last thing that we are doing is identifying asymptotes. So there's two types of asymptotes. We have vertical and horizontal. So for vertical asymptotes, you're looking at what makes the denominator equal zero. So in this example, the denominator is a quadratic, so I might want to factor it first to help myself out. So um, this would become x minus 2 and x plus 1. So the two numbers that would make the denominator turning to 0 would be 2 and negative 1. So my vertical asymptotes would be x equals 2 and x equals negative 1. Okay, my horizontal asymptotes, okay, is the biggest power of x. So what we do is we look at the whole function and we say, okay, what's the biggest power of x? And I'm going back to my original function here. So the biggest power of x in the whole problem is x squared. So then I say, how many x squareds do I have in the numerator? I have zero x squareds in the numerator and I have one x squared in the denominator. So then I just divide, zero divided by one is zero. So my horizontal asymptote is at y equals zero. So you can use this, talks about the end behavior, we can use this to decide what the, to match with graphs and decide what the end behavior is gonna look like. So a graph of this function, it means that as you get bigger x's and smaller x's, your graph's gonna approach that um, y equals zero. So it's gonna approach the x-axis. So if you were trying to match the graph, you'd be looking for something that in the long run is approaching that x-axis in both directions. Okay, the only other thing that was in the notes, just to go over really quick, is boundedness and local minima, maxima, so local extrema and absolute extrema. So if I have a graph like this, okay, we would call this bounded below because you can see it's going up on both ends, which means that it's unbounded on the upper part, but it is bounded on the lower part. So this would be bounded below. If you had a graph that was like the opposite of this, like this, this would be bounded above. Okay, and then this right here would be a local min, and this would be your absolute min, or just your minimum. Okay, just like the, up here, this would be a um, this would be a local max, and this would be your absolute max. Okay, so local means it's just it's a maximum or minimum relative to the area around it. And then your absolute max and min would be the overall for the whole function, the highest point or the lowest point. Okay, so that is everything. That is a lot of information for 1.2. Let me know if you have any questions about any of it.